Um, well, you have heard this morning a little bit a few of the water grants that we are subsidizing. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do with those is to look into um, innovative ideas um, that work around water security for farmers at local level. Um, IFAD is concerned with the, is exclusively concerned with rural, uh, marginalized, vulnerable, poor people, uh, men and women. So these, all these, uh, as you have seen, have been um, have been looking into a little um, paradigm how to push the idea. We have reached a certain level of information or understanding how to push it one step further. Um, there is uh, here we are working around the water week, um, but if you look back, each of those um, is also looking into the link between land and water. Uh, so <laughs> this is something that uh, we strongly believe in. Uh, they are uh, the business models that uh, Miriam started with is uh, around natural resource <coughs> management. There are both of them. Both aspects are important if we want to achieve the food production that will be needed. Uh, the challenge that we have uh, in the house <laughs> as well, uh, in IFAD, is, um, and that's, we have presented the work in progress that we have achieved right now. Uh, we are looking forward to the comments that will come in uh, one minute when I'm finished, <laughs> uh, is how to, um, to do better um, on the business model, the business cases uh, that we can then, uh, that can then be uh, scaled up to reach a certain uh, level of change, because that's what we're concerned with. That's why we're doing all of this, in essence. Um, we are aware that we, want, we need to change. Uh, IFAD is a UN institution, so, you know, a little bit heavy. But at the same time, uh, we do have some things that we can uh, come up with. Um, we need a little bit more details on um, that would demonstrate the validity of uh, every ideas that have been uh, mentioned here. Um, but we also need a little bit more information so that we can better advocate for it. Um, I don't know if you have noticed, but the time span uh, that, uh, the, that each of the cases we're talking about, that were presented, uh, they range between three, four, five years, 30 years in Ethiopia. You have to deal with that. Uh, this is what you have to compute in your investment. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, so, and how do you uh, target all the incentive that will secure the, um, that you maintain the effort while the market opens? Because all down the line, business model, it's uh, how to challenge a UN institution to reach out to the private sector and take on the market approach, right? So we also need to, be, to become even more professional into uh, developing the right incentive for the right amount of intermediate time until the market can take on. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Is one of the panelists, maybe for instance, uh, Mr. Wim Bastians, who uh, wants to react on that, uh, on that relationship as a grantee to his grantor? Um, yeah, I, th I think that is uh, an absolutely a good model. Um, I think it's what, what, I, what I like very much about IFAD is that when we were preparing the grant uh, proposal, it was already clear that um, it should be sustainable after the project. And I think it is so important that you give that message already from the first moment so that already in the first year of execution, you start to seek business relationships with partners in the countries. If you do that in the end after the project, you are too late. Uh, and I think it's so essential that you maximize this subsidy. I see it as a kind of subsidy to really launch something new. But you must do that with a vision that, uh, you know, you earn it back, that, that there is an enough, say, revenues uh, in the system that uh, it, 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 it continues. Uh, and that can be related to ICT, but that can also be related to the, con the continuation of land and, uh, and soil conservation. I think it's very important that, in a way, there is a mechanism that 
yeah, it, it's paid back for the services, and so that there is continuation. Please, Rodert, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to make a, a short comment on uh, one thing that Audrey said. Um, the the long-term scale of, of uh, the projects, we're talking here about scale, and we've mostly been talking about scale in the spatial sense, but I think it's also very important indeed to consider the temporal sense that uh, all these projects or programs, they need to focus on a longer term. I've already explained in my presentation that it takes quite a while before benefits of upstream land water management uh, become visible. And uh, I think Dr. Kiefle has uh, demonstrated that indeed after a 20 or 30 years period, uh, the, the effects are visible or can be visible. And that's, that's a very important thing to realize, whereas most donor programs and projects are usually three years, five years, and then finished. Unfortunately, our own IFA projects have finished after such a period. Is that recorded? <laughs> yes, it has been recorded and it's worldwide kind of known. I uh, think you make a very um, interesting remark here and that upscaling is indeed about uh, having a time perspective and that it uh, can take a generation, which therefore also would include, when we're talking about businesses, we also know about human resource development, how we should turn over knowledge from generation to generation and scale up ideas. There are many stories I've heard about that people are complaining that the knowledge is staying in the more senior part of the expert pool and that that knowledge needs to be better turned over to younger generations also for scaling up. Um, I would like to give the floor to the audience so if there are hands and questions please raise and uh, Chef please. Um, first of all I really enjoyed this morning. I, I really enjoyed this morning because in the first, at least for me, in the first time, we are on a kind of a congress which is all about the development cooperation, and at least now we are talking about business models. But the business model is a very interesting, but very essential driver for the long-term sustainability. I would like to address my question to Miriam, because I think you made very clear that um, if there is no business model for this long-term uh, development, then we can, like, we, we can do whatever we want, but then we will continue on funding projects. And uh, especially when we are funding projects where we always, again, prove the concept. And what we would like to do, even if the concept takes 30 years to develop, but what we want to do is that it scales, not that, we, that the project itself scales, but that the application of the project, the, the knowledge we gained, that, that is used for scaling. How can we get these impact investors you mentioned? And I think Wim Bastian said, meant, uh, he mentioned some examples of business of impact investors. The food industry, the suppliers, the equipment suppliers, the insurance companies. They are all interested in the impact we want to achieve. How can we get these impact investors on board from the beginning, I think even then it is maybe needed that we grant the kickstart development, but then at least we use the grants knowing that if this grant is well used, on the long term the investors will come up with the long term investment. So how can we guarantee when we start the concept proving, how can we guarantee that the impact investor is already on board and not to fund the program but to take the benefit of the first grant. So we make him a little bit, we make him owner of the long-term result he wants by making him stakeholder from the beginning. How do we get these impact investors on board from the beginning? Let me uh, repeat this question for our online viewers. So how do we get our impact, the question was how do we get our impact investors on board from the beginning of a scaling up process? Please, Mirjam. Well, that's an interesting question and I think that if we all had the answer to that, the investors would probably um, would have been inclusive in the whole process. But I think it goes back to um, 
I think mainly creating an enabling environment for these different investors. Again, if we're thinking about private sector participation, if you're really going to incentivize them to be a part of this process, then you need an environment that actually incentivizes them in a way. If in relation to whether there's a need for regulation of capital markets and um, subsidies for these investors. And so I think it goes back to creating an environment that actually incentivizes them to be a part of it. Um, I don't know if you want to add something to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an economist, but <laughs> I think it just really comes, it boils down to cost benefits. So if the costs are more than the benefits, it will not work even straight from the beginning, first time it has to be right, first time right. So if an insurance company sees that you know they have to invest a certain amount of money to monitor crop damage in a certain region, and if they see at the same time that by using such system they have to pay less, um, um, say, um, individual um, cases and their premium can change, and if that's all positive, then they buy in. They will, they will start. If it's all more costly than benefits, it's very difficult. Yes. Godut, yeah, please. Yeah, I think uh, in our Green Water Credits project, this is something we re realized from the beginning, and we tried to involve all parties from the beginning, so uh, the farmers upstream who finally have to do the work, but especially uh, which is even more crucial in, the, in, in this project, the possible investors downstream, like I mentioned, uh, the Kenya hydropower company and drinking water company. Uh, the only thing we could convince them with in the beginning was the modeling. And, if, and they got very enthusiastic about it, but of course they will only uh, really commit themselves when they, once they see some results. That's why we, we have to bridge this transitional period with external donor funding or donor or wherever it comes from. Uh, but uh, they, they won't start paying immediately because uh, yeah, that's, that's too much of a risk just based on hydrological modeling. Or the models should be improved, perhaps. But it's always happening. Eh? Also in your case, there has been public money invested in 25 years, uh, over 25 years in in your in knowledge the, base. In the research, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's always happening, actually. And, and yeah, to make that different, that, that's, that's not, uh, not very easy. It's also, the, these business models are, are based on public uh, investment. And, uh, hmm. that, yeah, and that's, that's a reality. Uh, we, we, we are not going to change by working uh, more business-wise. And we should realize that. But, this is not, not always uh, necessarily a problem. But mm. the, uh, yeah, that's the kind of investment made in the, in the past yeah. that now you should change into profits. Mm. Uh, first, I have a question for the sir here and then to the sir in the back. And then. Yeah, I have to excuse myself for being too much talkative today. But uh, this is not a question, it's a comment. And my comment is positioned on the other angle, uh, which I have been uh, trying to interpret it. Uh, what I have seen here is like uh, uh, we have forgot something which is very, very important according to my own perspective. And this is about uh, the potentiality of historical perspective. Uh, because what I believe for sustainable solution, we have to rethink back what has been done and what were the mistakes before. For example, in Ethiopia, uh, of course, there's a lot of successful stall has been said by doctor, and I really appreciate that. Uh, but to scale up, we need to understand the historical perspective that could scale up uh, to uh, in the sense that it could be much easier to know uh, which direction are we going based on the how much area has been successfully irrigated based on the information or based on the advancement of the technology which you have been uh, trying to advertise on. 
and this one could help us to understand in the future what could be the another future, I mean the another step. So I'm trying to emphasize about the historical, uh, the historical perspective on that. And that one could help us to understand really uh, how much we have invested and how much it costs on that investment. And what is real benefit based on the, uh, on the social, uh, the viable, the, the, the viable evidence based on the social outcome themselves. Because the social outcome, what do they need to see? They need to see some return, like there is increase in revenue, uh, there is an increase of number of students who are going to school, for example. All this kind of evidence is what it can be um, tried to show us. Now there is such kind of development. So I'm trying to, uh, to emphasize about, uh, we have to rethink about historical and we have to consider about the issue of cost benefit, which has been said uh, with the uh, present there. And also we have to give a pace for trying to involve the issue of social economic perspective. This could be very important because when we say about the model, it's just it's, it's look like a very rigid thing. It doesn't give a space to allow some. Okay, what does the real farmer need at the moment? Is it like information? I think we have something beyond of that, and that could be give the chance for the researcher to come in and give their link, uh, their, their their own what they have found, and from that perspective, they, it could be easy to understand, okay, now we are going in this direction. So that was my minor point. Well, thank you very much for uh, that comment. I would like to go on to the sir in the back. Uh, I guess I have, uh, <coughs> I have a follow-up. I agree with my colleague on some of his concerns and comments. When you design those projects, what is the, what is the major Uh, to whom are you addressing this question? Uh, to, the whole to the whole panel. Who wants to react on that? Uh, Dr. Kifle might be. So how do you... measure the, the impact and work on? Uh, <coughs> well, uh, honestly, uh, if you see the whole history, how the whole uh, uh, effort started, uh, there was no database to look at what was the initial uh, condition. Uh, so the base was based on theory, which, which you have in schools, and also some experience in, uh, in other countries like in India, China. We have that history that, okay, there is this type of positive uh, development. So the... Uh, uh, the, the, the main premise was that we will expect a positive change. And then these efforts were introduced. And uh, it was introduced bit by bit. But after some, especially uh, starting from the last five, 15 years, the government said, unless we do it, actually uh, there is one point which is indicated, uh, it's better to also address the approach, the steps, which had been, you know, implemented as as a learning uh, process actually, because there was at a certain moment that the government was also hopeless. Then said, "Okay, can we do something? Can we change if, if it's not going to be uh, effect like they were more like on uh, stone bands, for example. If you put some stones only, you you can keep some soil, but the moisture was not kept there." So this, this really has created some doubt that it may not work. But because there was no other alternative, either we have to move on a massive, and also including all this uh, uh, learning from the failures, or uh, you, you, know, you, you just abandon the region and uh, uh, you, you migrate. So the, the, the option was, let's, let's try it in a massive approach. Then now, things have started to improve. It's really improving without research, without database. But as a witness, I, was, I worked in the water sector now for almost 20 years. 
I was working in the exploration 20 years ago, and now those areas that we drilled some years back, now the, you drill and you get water. You have springs which are coming, which are not there. So you really can, can see the change uh, dramatically without um, having that whole database before. Even the farmers, they witness. And every farmer is, you know, when you, when you ask them for watershed, everybody is running, especially in his own watershed. And they know if you do where, what type of effect could be there. So in general, I don't think uh, it's really quantified in a way the positive uh, aspects of it. And nobody really could, could count also the cost because uh, on Thursday I'm going to, to present the cost-benefit aspect of it and how difficult it is to, to really quantify both the benefit and also the cost. Mm -hmm. So these all need to be taken into account when you really uh, g g grant projects. As, as funders, as donors, you really can see what type of... Uh, but I think uh, uh, any donor who has been involved in, the, uh, in supporting the watershed management in the northern part of Ethiopia, for sure, after 20, 30 years, it's paying back now. This one, I'm sure. But in the process, there are some donors who, who you know, who, who left because they said, oh, this is hopeless. Some, they come and so on. And so I think this needs to be taken care of into, into consideration. With the, with, the, with the proposals, like on this uh, smart, um, we, yeah, we, you know, it's good to see the, the, what's on the ground also. We have farmers who are working on the, in the form of unions involved in irrigation. And you have private investors who are all involved in the irrigation. These two, they are completely having different productivity and also market. And the major problem is, especially with the market, is because of information, lack of information by the farmers. By, not by the investors. The investors, they know where to sell, when to harvest. The farmers, they, once it's matured, they simply you know, try to harvest it and they store it. Even they try to sell it in the cheapest rate. And also technical support. They cannot uh, provide, uh, hire a consultant to support them uh, when you come with the unions, the farmers' unions. But the consultants, the, the, the investors, they can hire professionals, highly qualified professionals. So there is a big difference in both the uh, technical support as well as in the technical support means like the fertilizer, the irrigation management, and the like, and market. So this technology, I think it can really help a lot because they are not going to depend solely on uh, individual uh, you know, uh, expertise who will be, uh, you know, av should be available at, at, at site. So I think there is a, a lot that, that uh, these technologies can really uh, support. But my worry with, this, with, the, with the business model is that we need to consider the ups and downs, the challenges associated with, with, with this whole spectrum. If you simply uh, are looking for a very short span, then for sure nobody will invest and it will, it, will, it will not work. But there is a lot that we can really learn by uh, t taking into consideration the experience that we really have been uh, going through. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Kifli, for that uh, good explanation about many dimensions of creating an enabling environment uh, for upscaling innovation and getting to scale. Uh, Godet wanted to react on that. Please uh, keep it short, because yes. we're at the limit of our session. No, I'll be very brief, and it's, uh, I promise also it's the last time I'll talk about, about WOCAT this uh, morning, <laughs> maybe more this afternoon. Um, but, uh, yeah, WOCAT has been exactly uh, started 20 years ago, as I said, as a uh, tool to document and evaluate soil and water conservation technologies all over the world in a standardized, for, standardized format, so that uh, you can, it's not a quantitative uh, tool, it's based on expert opinion, but at least it's a first step towards uh, a good evaluation of uh, soil and water conservation for individual case studies, I have to say. It's not 
generally for a certain technology, but specifically for a case study on a specific uh, point. So www.wocat.net. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this plug. <laughs> small advertise. I would li like to give the last words to uh, Ms. Audrey Nebveu. Um, what is IFAD going to take, do with this uh, learning exercise of this uh, event? And uh, maybe you could also address the uh, water for food, COP, and invite all the people here in the audience to our uh, booth to help us and to connect all those dots yes. that are here in the room. Okay, thank you. Uh, what are we going to do with this? Um, well, if you look at green water credits, uh, we didn't do much about it. Uh, a little bit, though. Um, but uh, more importantly, I think, is uh, the uptake that go beyond IFAD. So that, for me, is the, the, major, um, the major result. Mm. Uh, this is why we'll, uh, the, the bulk of the, from the challenge that we have also internally in IFAD, if, you, if we really want to scale up the innovations that we have identified or that we know about, uh, the knowledge that we have on how to time the, this kind of intervention within the time, uh, how to trigger the, uh, the incentives, uh, we need a, a space to share all of this information. Um, and that is the, to, to bring people together that are interested in the same topic. Uh, there, is, uh, there is one booth close to the CWE booth where we're displaying what we have come up with for now. It's not yet, uh, com uh, it's a website, a platform that uh, we try to finish and put together for uh, all of you, uh, the people that are here, and those ones that could not come to Stockholm, <laughs> to come together and share their very local experience so that uh, we can really learn from each other. Uh, we would uh, very much welcome uh, your contribution, your reaction on the, what we are proposing, uh, because then we could finalize the, the building of that one. Thank you very much, Audrey. Then it's, uh, I think, time to close this session and that we are going to refuel ourselves with some food. Um, I would like to thank the speakers, Miriam, Wim, Dr. Kifle and Godet, especially, for your input. I would like to thank the audience for their input. Um, I would urge, if you still have questions, come to the IFAD booth. We are here all week. Uh, or just, well talk to us, we are uh, very open and not scary people and uh, we're going to exchange our ideas and interests. Thank you very much, I think it was a very nice session and I wish you all a very pleasant World Water Week. Thank you. Well done.